<laughs> <There's> John. <laughs> My name is uh, Anil Madhavipedi from the University of Cambridge, and, uh, and, and John is from uh, Citrix Systems. And um, so this is a slightly unusual uh, presentation because this is a project that's been going on uh, for about four years, and um, uh, we're just about to come to our first 1.0 release, so I wanted to just give you an update. Um, this, this entire slide deck is actually self-hosted on a little tiny uh, microkernel uh, uh, that's entirely type safe and uh, written, uh, written in a language called Wacamel. And it's also running on an open source version of Zen Server, which is also uh, something we want to update you about. Uh, and everything is running online on the internet. So uh, there really is a dramatic kind of self-hosted aspect of all this that uh, might or might not have been working about an hour ago, but it's definitely working now. So, <laughs> so before I get started, because there's quite a lot of content and um, uh, we only have half an hour, how many people here are familiar with Mirage and have heard of it before in a previous presentation? Great. How many have never heard of it and have no idea what's going on? All right, a few. So what I'll do is I'll give you a, a very quick update on what Mirage is, just to give you a, a, a feel for it, and then we'll, we'll move on to, um, uh, to, to, to how it all works. So the basic idea is that uh, right now we have uh, the cloud, and we have lots and lots of bad traffic coming in from the internet, you know, from SANS, internet, NASs, and SDNs, where, wherever it is. And typically, uh, we're going through a lot of C codes. So there's a lot of uh, uh, potential unsafety there. And Zen takes a lot of um, effort to try to secure those domains. So what we want to do is to try to figure out how do we make everything type safe so that we can get past this whole problem of buffer overflows and general memory on safety. The problem is we tend to, uh, for example, write our applications in a type safe language, but we're not really protecting uh, the kernel, which is what sees the traffic first. We're not protecting our back-end device drivers. And it's a bit like protecting your generals in a, in a battle, but not really giving your frontline troops the defenses, because your, if once your kernel gets owned, user space is, uh, is, in, um, is out of luck. So um, given that most of the attacks never come from within the VM, you know, you tend to trust the code running within the VM, we're trying to figure out um, how can we rearrange and rethink the way that we construct these guest operating systems in such a way that everything is type safe. Uh, and the reason we can pull this off, the reason we can build a new operating system um, is because two things have changed in the last, uh, in the last five years. Uh, the first thing is that the hypervisor Zen gives us a very stable hardware interface, which means that we don't have to keep working on device drivers. Uh, and the last few research operating systems built in Cambridge, it's one called Nemesis that uh, uh, Ian Pratt and co worked on before Zen, uh, all bit rotted because graduate students could no longer um, uh, write device drivers. And also now in the cloud, we tend to care about protocol compatibility, not so much ABIs anymore. I want to deal with HTTP interconnects and so on. So given this, what's our solution? And the solution is very simple. It's something called unikernels. I want to write high-level source code. And this high-level source code compiles directly into a virtual machine that crunches down all of the layers. And so you can really view virtual machines as kind of Unix processes done right on the cloud. Instead of having multiple layers of software, um, I will just have my compiler output a, uh, a complete Zen kernel that's standalone that can be scheduled and run independently on, on the cloud. Uh, the problem, of course, the devil's in the detail. Uh, how do you go from this whole idea of building an embedded system to actually having a usable programming environment for actually building products? And that's what John will talk about because uh, Zen Server, the Citrix uh, uh, cloud tool stack, is adopting a lot of these principles uh, in, in its use. So the contributions, the things we've been working really hard on is trying to figure out how do we go from um, high-level source code and a high-level program interface uh, to outputting these, uh, these usable things. And this involves a technique called library operating systems, which is turn your entire operating system, all 15 million lines of code in Linux, uh, into a set of reusable libraries that you can, you can um, repurpose for uh, um, outside of the kernel space. Uh, and also the final, uh, the final uh, outputs are all in a little single address-based VMs that are very efficient. They only do one thing. Uh, they, 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 um, uh, they run um, uh, the OCaml runtime. How many people here have ever done any functional programming or statically typed programming in general, playing with high-level languages? So about, about half the room. Uh, anyone, OCaml uh, in particular? Uh, about Haskell, perhaps? Yeah, OK, yeah, so we've got about Haskell and OCaml. So the difference really between um, a lot of, uh, um, uh, a lot of the, the techniques we espouse is a focus on static typing. And the reason for this is that we really want to be able to reject bad code at compile time. So unlike the use of Scheme or, or PHP or, 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 or Ruby or, or, or even nice languages like, like, like um, Erlang, which is a very functional language, um, we really want to be able to type and make and have the entire set of source code in the application compiled down and rejected if there's some inconsistency. So it's a combination of static typing and module systems that make this stuff possible. And what a module system is, is just a very, very scalable way of building very large systems that can, uh, they, where code can be reused. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you some examples of this. 
So currently what happens right now when we build an appliance is that uh, you go through lots and lots of tools to build an appliance, right? So I go to some source code, some object files, this goes to a linker, and the linker goes to um, a user on library, which is then executed and talks to the kernel. Mirage is completely different. Uh, in Mirage, what happens is that everything is a library written in a camel, and we tend to go through one tool chain uh, that uh, links everything, such as device drivers and network stacks and so on, um, and then it uh, links a boot library, which makes the device bootable, and then you give it all the configuration files, also more camel code. So you're satisfying all of your dependencies. Um, and in the end, the compiler just gets an enormous number of source files. So, for example, around 10 million lines of code for a typical kernel. And then it outputs a standalone kernel. So this means that it has a complete view on what's going on. So how does this um, actually work in practice? The problem is, uh, and this is why the project took uh, four years, is that building a single quick hack of an embedded uh, microcontroller is quite, uh, is, is quite easy. The problem is when you're actually writing code, no one wants to de uh, debug microkernels because you don't have any of the, the useful big large utility of, um, of large tool stack. So we, we started propounding this, uh, this workflow of developing code under Unix, which is nice for so camel code and a nice uh, you know, Emacs or VIA editor. And then you want the ability to progressively remove bits of Unix by replacing them with type safe equivalents. And then the final step is just to recompile to kind of eject yourself from Unix and end up with a microkernel. So the majority of your logic and your programming can happen in user space where, where um, uh, you won't go insane trying to debug kernels uh, and you have the benefits of, of Unix management stack. But in the end, the production should all be detached and be the minimal possible thing that, uh, that goes out there. So how does this work? Well, um, the, 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 reason, uh, the, the reason this is hard is because it's all about build systems and package management, right? Uh, because if we're pushing everything into our compiler, uh, you need to be able to figure out uh, how do I specify that I'm running under Unix, how do I specify I'm running under Zen, uh, and just deal with this enormous dependency problem that, that results from turning your entire 15 million lines of um, uh, kernel code into, uh, into libraries. So this year, uh, specifically, uh, for those who have heard about Mirage before, there's been a huge amount of progress because we've been focusing on, we set ourselves a goal of releasing uh, Mirage 1.0 this year. So of course that means December is, the, uh, is, is, is when we release, just the very last minute. And um, what we've done this year is to take all of the source code we've written, which is uh, entire operating system kernels, TCP IP stacks and ML, uh, a full set of Zen device drivers from Blockfront, from Netfront, from Ring drivers, and all the protocols. And we've also glued it together by building a new package manager called OPAM. Uh, and we've also hooked it into uh, the Travis continuous integration system. Um, one of the interesting things is how popular this package manager became. So OPAM, uh, uh, the OCaml community is generally considered quite small. Uh, since we released OPAM in March, over 1,800 unique packages have been, uh, sorry, 1,800 packages and of which 530 are unique have been up uploaded to OPAM due to our kind of GitHub network effect thing that's been, that's been going on. And we've also released uh, an O'Reilly book called Real World Camel. So um, a lot of the pieces are rapidly coming together to, to make all this stuff work. I wanted to show you quickly just a screencast to give you an idea of how this stuff works. So I'm, I'm starting on Mac OS X, which, in, which is what this um, is hosted on, and I can just use Homebrew to install OPAM. So uh, this is a very normal development environment, nothing fancy required, uh, no, certainly no use of Zen. And uh, when you initialize OPAM, it connects to GitHub, and it just retrieves the latest set of uh, Mirage packages, more generally OCaml packages that are, um, uh, that are available. Uh, and this is quite nice because it gives you a nice workflow where you can decide which packages to pin and which packages to, uh, uh, to use. For example, this is saying OPAM for Mirage and it's telling me uh, the full set of packages that are available. Now at this point, I can OPAM install Mirage Unix and, uh, and it will go and download a whole bunch of libraries. And so this, what this is doing is setting up a development environment for me such that um, I can just say I want to build this presentation uh, using, using, using uh, Unix on my Mac. Uh, and the fact that it downloads everything uh, means that uh, I now have an environment where all of my libraries for my operating system are available in Unix mode, and I can just clone my website, again, off GitHub, and I can just type in make. So when this is built, this just gives you a Unix, uh, a Unix binary. This Unix binary isn't using sockets as normal. It's actually using Tontap on Mac OS X to go off and uh, uh, link in the OCaml uh, network stack and then redirect packets via Tontap so it's, everything is being handled as if it were uh, it were uh, an operating system except running within Unix. So when I build this web server, I can just connect to my local host. I've set up my networking so it's 1002, and I'm now running this one of these Unix kernels on, on Mac OS X. And you can see here, uh, there's all, the, all, all of the debug code. Now the cool thing, I can then switch to Ubuntu and say, well, I've now debugged my, my website, and I want to run this uh, on Ubuntu, so I can just add a PPA. And the PPA sets up the OCaml environment, uh, except in Ubuntu. 
Uh, and at this point, you know, it can do the, uh, the install again to get the right version of a camel, but a new target becomes available. And the new target here is the fact that it can discard the Linux dependency, set up a cross-compilation environment, and ensure that it works, uh, it, it outputs a Zen kernel instead. So at this point, the only thing I have to do differently, uh, apart from uh, the app kit installs for, uh, for OPAM, is also, we've also packaged up everything in Ubuntu, um, is to, let me just speed this one up, uh, this is just doing the same thing as before, we're just cloning the same website, but when I do the um, installation, I simply tell my package manager, OPAM install uh, Mirage Zen instead. So the package manager is getting a target. I'm telling it, I want you to target Zen or target Unix, and it goes off and it figures out exactly what set of constraints and libraries to pick out, and it just gives you the right set, and then it makes sure all the cross-compilation is set up. So you can imagine this is a source code version of um, uh, Ubuntu's apt, apt-get package manager. Apt-get has a sophisticated constraint solver to deal with, with binary packages, and OPAM actually reuses that constraint solver to deal with source code dependencies. Uh, and so a typical kernel involves hundreds of libraries, Therefore, this thing just scales and it just works. So um, that was just a whirlwind tour. It's uh, available online to, to, uh, to show you what's going on. So just to summarize that, all we have to do is we just write a normal bit of a camel code. Uh, and this is, this is slightly misformatted, but this is a DNS server. Uh, and then you write a configuration file that gives it the configuration. And this is translated into a camel as well. So everything is uh, homogeneously put together uh, and compiled. Then I simply type in opam install Mirage Unix, uh, and I can run it under Unix. And then once I've debugged it, uh, I can recompile the same source code uh, to Zen by OPAM install Mirage Zen, and I can just use Excel to, to construct it as normal. Uh, and then when all that's done, the magic happens via the OCaml module system, and everything is, uh, is, is, is type safe. Any errors or inconsistencies will be rejected. So how, how, do, how does this work? The, the whole point of doing this in OCaml and not in uh, a language with a less powerful module system is that we had to convert the entire operating system. So imagine everything you have in a typical uh, Unix environment into, uh, into the OCaml module system. So I'm obviously not going to give uh, a full tutorial on the OCaml module system, but this should be uh, something that uh, a beginner can understand. So let's say I want to build a home page. And when I build a home page, I typically need to have an HTTP service. So I have, a mo I have a module dependency on that. Now, HTTP requires some notion of TCP. So therefore, the most obvious way to, to do TCP is to map it to Unix sockets. So we use a kernel. And then that depends on a Unix module. So this is a very normal programming environment. Um, the, the, the thing we did next was to say, well, you actually have a choice here. If I want to compile into Unix, I have two ways of doing it. My TCP module can either be sockets, or um, I can actually implement a complete uh, a networking stack and then satisfy that via TunTap, which is an Ethernet driver under Unix. So we now have a branching point where uh, when I'm installing under Unix, I can say, well, go the TunTap route and eventually you'll find a module graph that will satisfy TCP, or go down the Unix route and depend on sockets. But the TunTap route has less dependency on Unix, right? Because it's not using the kernel networking stack. Well, and you can take this to an extreme. So then I can say, well, you know, I don't want to depend on the Unix module at all. Uh, can you give me a module graph that will just give me a Zen route instead? And suddenly, my network interface driver, uh, NetIF there, instead of using TunTap, will go to a ring module, which will go into an event channel module and a Zen store module, and then voila, you suddenly have a, a Zen microkernel. So this is literally just taking the entirety of Unix, converting it into a structured module graph, and breaking up your, uh, your, your conceptual uh, notion of Unix into a set of libraries. And these set of libraries can be repurposed and retargeted for many, many uses. So this is a fragment of the graph. You can also compile many of the Zen modules under Unix, and they will use the user space uh, device drivers, grant dev, uh, grant dev, and event channel, uh, so that you can often compile Zen apps either as microkernels or in domain zero. So it gives us an immense amount of flexibility in how you build and retarget and reuse the source code. And really, this is the purpose, is to build up a reusable library stack that we can depend on for, uh, for a long time. So there's lots and lots of repositories online on, on GitHub Mirage. Uh, and so in particular, we, uh, we have support for an incre increasingly exotic number of targets. So I've talked about Zen and uh, Unix. We also have a JavaScript backend. We haven't quite figured out what that's for. But you can use exactly the same principles of re-taking a module and, and compiling it to JavaScript. Uh, this summer, we had an intern who built a FreeBSD kernel module backend as well. So instead of having a notion of an operating system as syscalls, he expressed the, uh, the uh, intra-kernel uh, APIs as uh, OCaml modules, and suddenly you can target the source code and just load a kernel module instead. So we've actually got a version of the Mirage website in this presentation being run directly from a, a kernel module without ever hitting user space. 
And so many of the repositories, for example, ZenStore, uh, the Merge platform, have implementations that map to each of these things, but expose a consistent module interface. So for example, the ZenStore one runs on, uh, on, on Unix and, uh, and Zen, and uh, very recently under FreeBSD. Uh, we have a, a block driver that compiles uh, um, to block front or block back, either in Unix or in, or in Zen, et cetera, et cetera, and, and VChan and so on and so forth. So this really is, for, is why Mirage is called Mirage. It, it's not really an operating system, it's just a collection of libraries that you can glue together. It's kind of an, we're kind of arms dealers, and you can, you can just assemble them for whatever problem you have um, at any, any given time. To give you an idea of what it looks like, it's actually a very natural encoding of the devices. This is Blockfront. It's just got a, a record, which is a set of features, and then the, it's got a state descriptor, T, which is just you know, an abstract state descriptor, and you can create, enumerate, and read and write pages just as you might do in C. So uh, the, the modules are relatively simple and should be recognizable to anyone who's, uh, who's done um, any, any kind of coding in this space. So what are the cool uses of this stuff? I said, you know, we could do anything with this. And um, the students in Cambridge have been going crazy. So they've been, uh, they've been, we've been working on moving our home pages into little microkernels. So these microkernels tend to be about a megabyte in size. So it's very nice for just quickly launching devices um, on EC2 or Rackspace. Uh, and uh, because uh, they're all written on a camel, you can introspect the values. Um, we can actually self scale. So if a queue gets too overloaded, you just do a VM create and you spin up and fork another VM. Uh, and so these things can, uh, can have a notion of scaling built into them. Uh, and it all compiles to ARM as well. So there's a native code version ARM, and we're working on the um, uh, Zen ARM backend. Uh, because we control the entire set of stack, you the TCP stack is just a library, uh, you don't have any artificial uh, you know, POSIX style restrictions. So we've been using this to build lots of middle boxes that need to do very low level net, uh, protocol manipulation. So specialized TCP stacks that are data center TCP, for example. Uh, we can build custom block backends that do encryption and, and storage. So we have several, uh, several demos of those coming out. And one of the most interesting ones is uh, because we know everything going into the virtual machine, uh, we can actually do this crazy thing. So let me explain this diagram. So you have a programmer who's green, and you have a cloud, which is the enemy. And the cloud is basically where all the bad guys are. So what we're doing is we're putting a compiler right in the middle of this, so that everything going to the cloud is going through a statically typed compiler. So whenever I compile some OCaml code, I put it through a SAT solver that is uh, resolving my dependencies. Uh, and then I have a precise notion of what Git trees are going to my code. So then it goes into a compiler, which links it and outputs a Zen kernel. Uh, and then we push this to a binary repository on GitHub because it's just one megabyte, we can push the binary file. At this point, whenever you push it to the cloud, um, the cloud can watch GitHub because it knows the source code it depended on. And anytime anyone pushes to that source code, it just recompiles itself. So in other words, you've got a direct relationship between your GitHub repositories and uh, the, the, the microkernels that are, uh, that are actually being deployed. So if you contrast this to Linux right now, there's a very kind of loose dependency graph. You don't really know what's gone into your image because you have a set of binaries, a set of source code, and you might be running ad hoc things like Puppet and Chef. In this case, we have a very, very precise dependency graph. There's obviously an extreme position, and, uh, and, and off we go into, um, into, uh, into closing the loop. So we really do plan this future where the compiler and a computer can react faster than humans and just know exactly what you've put in the cloud and just react and, 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 and kind of get up there. So uh, I'm not going to talk about the microbenchmarking stuff. Uh, uh, yep, good. Yeah, we have, we have lots of time. So uh, the, the slides are online. There's actually a lot more information. I'm happy to, to talk about this later on. But there's lots and lots of information and in, uh, in general up here. But the, really, the, the neat use of, of Zappy, uh, of, of Mirage, is its application of Zappy project. So I'm going to hand it over to John, and, uh, and he's going to tell you exactly how the, uh, uh, how the, how the rest of the, the stack fits together. Go for it, John. So, um, right. Uh, so Zappy project. I'm going to start by introducing a bit, um, because, uh, yes, it's uh, not entirely clear to everyone what this is. So Zappy project is the, it's the core of a Zen server. OK, so it's, uh, uh, it's not just the, the Zappy daemon that runs within your Zen server. It's, it's all these surrounding bits and pieces that are required to make it into a functioning system. Uh, it's a mix of it's lots and lots of the camel code, a fair bit of Python, and bits of, uh, of scripting glue around the, the edges. So what, what does that enable the Zen server to do? So um, uh, we do a lot of stuff. We, we handle lifecycle operations. Um, we've got a, a, a metadata database for all your VMs. Uh, we expose this database and the operations over an XMLRPC API. Uh, we've got the statistics. Uh, we do networking setup. We, uh, we do man manage bonds, your VLANs. You're uh, using OpenSVC, which all bridge mode um, 
Uh, we've got storage manipulation um, via, via plugins. So all sorts of different uh, uh, plugins, uh, which so NFS or LVM-based things or various others, uh, which do um, which manage the, the sort of life cycle of your disks. Memory ballooning. Uh, we do disaster recovery, high availability, live storage. Micro there's, there's an awful lot of stuff that it does. Okay, so it's it's a bit of a beast that's grown over uh, many many years. Uh, so that that's what what a Zen server does. Uh, so this is the the kind of uh, a vague architecture of, of what's going on inside the Zen server. Uh, so there's lots of pieces: Zen, the kernel, Zen store. There's there's other bits I haven't written down. QMU. There's uh, uh, PV drivers which I haven't written down. Now of this, this is the uh, the Zappy project. Okay, it's it's your uh, your Zenopsd, the thing that drives Zen. It's the SqueezeD that does the ballooning, the network daemon. The RD daemon, which is the statistics gathering storage API server. Some of the plugins, not all of them, um, but most of them. Uh, the CLI, not the uh, access console, not the Zen Center, uh, not the kernel, not the DOM zero, not, not, not those, those, uh, the other bits and pieces. So it's first appeared in, uh, uh, in Zen Server 4.0 in, in 2007. Uh, and then we open sourced it in 2009, so it's been on, on, uh, on GitHub ever since. Uh, in uh, 2012, we did this uh, project Kronos, uh, which was um, uh, get, trying to get Zappy uh, and its uh, and the other demons into Debian and Ubuntu, um, which I'll talk a little bit more in a second. Uh, in 2013, then uh, we uh, transferred this to, to the Linux Foundation, um, and we also open sourced the rest of Zen Server. Okay, so uh, hang on, there we go. Uh, so Kronos project. Um, this was the first. Uh, effort really to get Zappy working in an environment that wasn't uh, Zen Server or XCP as it was then, uh, and um, it was it was a long way from being distro agnostic. It took a lot of work, a lot of patches to to, to get this actually working on a Debian system, and and in fact um, it was it was a success. We, we got it in there, it, it works, but we learned a lot of lessons uh, as a result of this. So uh, we we did have a an embedded mentality when when we were developing uh, Zappy and, and Co. Uh, so, uh, if, if there's a problem in LVM, you know, we, we could have fixed it in in, uh, in the storage plugins or in LVM, and we're, we're we're an embedded distro. Let's go and fix it in the easiest possible place in LVM. This is not really good when you're trying to actually then put this thing into uh, uh, into Ubuntu or Debian, where there's a normal LVM. Okay, it doesn't doesn't work. Um, uh, so that that was bad. Um, um, Secondly, what, what got into Debian, because, partly because of this, was really a, a fork of, of uh, the Zappy project. Um, we had to make a, a lot of changes, lots of patches, and it was really a bit of a sort of dead end, really, because we, we didn't get those patches. There were very specific patches uh, to, to make this work and didn't get back into the main line. Not really a sustainable model. Um, so, since joining the Linux Foundation, um, uh, we, we've got this goal to become a lot more distro-friendly. Um, and a lot of this is helped, in fact, by, by sharing with the Mirage uh, project, uh, because uh, um, the, the, uh, the idea of, of turning a lot of things into libraries is, is a really uh, a goal that benefits both projects. So, so what we did was uh, we originally had two quite monolithic um, uh, um, repositories. We, we chopped them up into much smaller bits. So uh, uh, our two became 50 odd or something like this. Um, a lot of libraries, so uh, for example, the, the Zen store one, which is, is now shared, shared memory rings, um, and then other ones which aren't, so, uh, which aren't directly shared yet, uh, NBD and uh, LVM um, bindings, things like this. Uh, and we also split up the daemons as well, so the uh, Zen API repository became uh, Zenopsd, became um, uh, XCP NetworkD, um, uh, XCP RDD, uh, ver various other repositories. So it's all been split up. Um, this has been really useful. It, it, it means that the, the job of, of getting these things into more uh, upstreamable, uh, downstreamable, um, uh, distro-friendly type repositories uh, becomes a lot easier because you only have to make like SqueezeD look nice and then job done. You then go and make, make NetworkD look nice and it, it's, it's a much easier uh, thing than, than making the whole thing work properly. So we've been doing it sort of bit by bit. Uh, we've been putting as much as possible in, uh, of this into OPAM. So we've got a, a, an OPAM repository uh, that, that's got all of these libraries in um, that you can get from GitHub. Uh, that's been uh, really useful. Um, what else has happened? So Zen Server Core. Um, 
we took, took all these uh, all these split apart things. They're now much easier to get into uh, packages for for reposit uh, for for uh, distributions. Uh, so um, so we did that. So we, we've uh, so in fact Ewan uh, is going to be giving a talk uh, next in in this room, I think, talking about uh, Zen Server Core. But it's really it's the, the the it's kind of the partly the fruits of this this effort to to split things up. We can now package them up much more easily. So. Uh, um, uh, we are producing packages uh, to, to install primarily on, on CentOS 6.4, um, but, but also uh, Ubuntu and, and Debian uh, are both also important targets for this. And importantly, it's, re it's the same code base as Zen Server. So we're not uh, using a fork now. All, all the patches have been upstreamed. Everything is, is now uh, um, we're running from the same set of Git repositories. So it's, uh, it's really good for that. Uh, so this, so the idea is, so so we make the, this the Zappy project as as a whole usable on a any normal Linux. So in order to make this happen, we've had to put a few extra components in, the ones that aren't specifically part of Zen Server. For example, uh, the the storage management that that we had had before was was very based on taking over the storage completely, uh, and not being very friendly with, uh, not not sort of coexisting. Uh, with, uh, with with other other things going on on your storage, so we had to make uh, FFS the the, uh, the the flat file system SR, uh, which um, uh, just puts VHDs down on your local uh, local drive, it makes it much easier to, to actually test this stuff on on a Debian or CentOS box. We got the Zen Zen Server install wizard because we don't have a, a host installer now, so we can't uh, sort of set the thing up uh, exactly as as uh, Zen Server or XCB used to. Uh, so we, we need we this install wizard just Puts some things in place. Puts the uh, the, the Zen uh, make makes Zen your your, your default uh, grub target. Uh, sets up uh, bridging or or, or whatever uh, that, that those sorts of bits and pieces. Um, uh, and message switch and libvirt. I'm not going to talk too much about that because I don't have much time. Um, so what, what's going on uh, next? In uh, so uh, immediate next uh, in Q4 2013, we're we're working really hard on the libzen light port. So this is really important. Uh, LibZenLite is, uh, um, is, is what uh, um, the, uh, the Zen project are using to, to manage their, their VMs. Uh, it's uh, 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 the, the library that's designed to be, to be uh, supported by them to, to do these sorts of things. Uh, and uh, so what we had been using was binding directly to Zen Control and doing everything ourselves manually, uh, which has meant that every time we upgraded Zen, we had to fix all the things that, that broke. So the ZenLite port is going to, going to fix all of these things. Um, now this is, I think this is the, the first time that, that uh, libzenlite has been used outside of the context of Excel. So we, we've had, well, not well, so not, so not, not sorry, there, there is a libvirt one as well, yeah. Um, so, um, uh, but in importing it, we, we found that we need to make a, a fair few patches. So, so a lot of these patches have been sent to the, uh, the Zendevel list and are going to go, in, hopefully going to, to Zen 4.4. Um, so um, uh, it's, it's quite, it's a little bit tough to compile this back end at the moment, so it's not built by default. Um, but uh, but we're, we're working on that. Um, so what else we're going? Um, so we've got Xenostats. So this is a project to uh, to more efficiently gather statistics from your VMs. So um, at the moment, we're, a lot of the statistics go go via ZenStore, and this is this is a terrible idea because you, you, your ZenStore is, is important for sort of control operations. And if you put if you're trying to do uh, uh, write you know your your memory use, utilization from all your hundreds of VMs into ZenStore at the same time, it, it's uh, uh, it makes the whole thing grind to a halt. So uh, the idea is for, for Xenostats is to, to use a, some shared memory uh, and a lock, uh, basically a lock-free thing so that your guests will, will write their stats into there and something in DOM0 will read it out and, and if, if, it, uh, if it sees sort of corrupt data, whatever, it doesn't, doesn't matter, you can throw that update away because it's not, it's not sort of important for, for your, the continued running of the system. It, it's, it's important for the, uh, uh, just, just for the, the, the stats. Um, what else? We, we've got uh, Zen Test VM project. Uh, so this is where, uh, again, using Mirage. Uh, this is really good. So, so Mirage um, gives us a, a unikernel that, that can boot in like uh, uh, microseconds. Uh, so we can, we can use this for, uh, for really fast, efficient testing of all sorts of bits of, uh, of, of functionality. One of the, the, the difficulties we have with, uh, uh, with the Zappy project as an open source project is that it's so broad and expansive um, that if you try and put a patch in, uh, it, there's a reasonably good chance you'll break something somewhere. Uh, and we, we, uh, uh, we, we've, we have uh, ZenRT uh, to, to do this sort of running nightly. Now, this is coming out, uh, out as a, as a, uh, to be used as a service, as, as, uh, as Alex was talking about yesterday. 
Um, but it's still, it's, it's a very uh, um, latent way of finding out what, what things you've broken. So getting something that, that works really quickly and, and easily to, to give you uh, feedback on, on a lot of the functionality of the Zapier project is going to be really useful. So we're working on that. Um, um, we're also working on the message switch. Um, so this is again uh, for um, uh, partly uh, uh, motivated with, with Mirage in mind. Uh, what we'll want to be, what Mirage allows us to do is that we've got all these libraries now that, that do aspects of, of our um, of our control stack, of, um, and uh, what we can do is, is now package them up into smaller units and and put them into uh, run them in VMs. So not everything is running in in uh, in, in DOM zero. Uh, so, for example, ZenStore is an obvious target here. We can we can put make a ZenStore uh, daemon, uh, use um, link it with uh, the Mirage kernel, and have that running as a as a separate domain. Um, so, uh, uh, the message switch here is is to is uh, something that's going to give us a um, um, a way of communicating with all sorts of different types of, of, of VMs that we'll be uh, sort of spitting off from the Zapier project for that. Um, Next year, we've got uh, uh, another Zen server release coming out uh, at some point. So there's going to be lots of bug fixes, which is uh, going to be good news. Um, we're going to be working on uh, some improvements to the database. So currently, this is a, um, a sort of bespoke uh, camel implementation within uh, Zappy, uh, the process. Uh, there's, there, we're going to be needing to, uh, to do some improvements there to improve uh, uh, a few uh, um, problems that there are with, with that implementation. Uh, again, this is this is something that, that could be targeted as something we can hoist into a into a VM if we want to. Uh, we need to continue the the cleansing that we have been doing of, of the uh, Zen API repository. So uh, we 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 took out the network daemon, the RD daemon. There, there's still some bits in there that, that, that require a fair bit of work to to clean that up. Um, then we, we're going to be doing some some work to support the Windsor architecture, which is this the, the architecture where we have drive domains uh, and so forth that's been talked about several times before. Um, uh, Zenstore Mirage uh, VM, as I, as I mentioned. Um, so please come join in um, to both projects. We have uh, um, Zen Server core releases where you can test this bleeding edge stuff. Uh, we've also got nightly releases of, of, uh, of Zen Server. Uh, all the development is, is open and on GitHub uh, under the, the Zappy project or Mirage uh, spaces. Uh, pull requests are welcome. about uh, four minutes over, but we could probably uh, squeeze in a couple of quick questions. Any questions? So this is a randomly specific question about Mirage. Um, the test VM, have you got SSH working in Mirage? Uh, yeah, so I actually run an SSH implementation for my PhD in 2006, actually. So um, the, f by the December release, we're going to have a, an interactive console and SSH going into it. So it's just a matter of adapting the old SSH code. It's, you know, it's, it's eight years old, and uh, it should be fine. What we're currently using for the, uh, the, the test VM is VChan. So we're talking direct over, over VChan from Dom Zero. So uh, this, the reason I was thinking, just for context, is there's a whole load of Bowage OpenStack tests. Mm -hmm. And we'd like to run Zen on Zen, which kind of is good but sucks. Um, so if we can have like a small VM that does SSH that just passes all the other tests, uh, this, is, this, this is, is a good thing. Yeah, <laughs> this yeah. is exactly what, what we're doing as well. We're running yeah. Zen server yeah. VMs, and then uh, so currently um, nested HVM is not really not terribly good, <laughs> but um, but for running PV guests like these Mirage guests, it's absolutely perfect. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. Really, really good. Yeah. So, so one of the challenges here is just the enormity of the, the this project. So there's hundreds of repositories, and right. so we, we have a challenge getting to December. So what I'd really like to do is to find a few focus use cases and just kind of satisfy those. So this sounds like a great one, right? So the test game is probably the first yeah, thing. I, we'll... the, the goal here is getting uh, Zen Server and Zappy project as a tier A hypervisor in OpenStack. This is one way of doing that. So right. it's fast enough it can gate on it. Right. And it has to gate to be tier, tier one. Right, right, got it. So this is kind of some kind of a build verification test where you just have to pass it quickly to... Exactly, you actually start a whole cloud and start connecting volumes and SSH again, but still, you can't, you have yeah. to pass those tests to get into trouble. Got it, got it. Sweet, thank you. Let's follow up on that. Uh, one last quick question from someone. One time. All right, let's give them a hand. Great, thanks for your time. Thank you.